Hey everybody, DM Galabond here, and today on Monster Monday, we're going to take another look at a monster that comes out of the Nether Deep campaign from Critical Role, and that is the Corrupted Giant Shark. We're going to talk a little bit about the shark's place in the history of D&D, and we're going to look at how the Corrupted Giant Shark differs from the regular giant shark. And then we're gonna take a stab at a couple of homebrew variants for a giant shark, just in case you wanna challenge parties of another tier of play. So let's dive right in. Now, it may surprise you to learn that sharks have been monsters in D&D since the days of basic edition. Now, most of us think of knights fighting dragons and thieves exploring in dungeons and all that kind of stuff, but seaborne adventures featuring pirates and the monsters of the deep have been right there from the very beginning of D&D. In the early editions, there was even a form of lycanthrope called a were-shark, which were merfolk that had contracted the curse of lycanthropy and turned into sharks under the light of the full moon. Now, giant sharks have also been a mainstay of D&D, and this seems kind of natural, since the game got its start just about the same time that film director Steven Spielberg and movie score composer John Williams scared the living bejesus out of everybody and made them want to go nowhere near the oceans with the incredible monster movie Jaws. So, back in basic D&D, and it's just a little snapshot of how big sharks have been in the game from the beginning. Back in basic D&D, you had the great white shark. Now these monsters are 30 feet long or longer, and they have a gray top and a white underside. And their lore about them is they're known to destroy small boats. Yeah, just like the monster in Steven Spielberg's movie. In AD&D, or first edition D&D, you had the giant shark, which was also known as the Megalodon. Now, the Megalodons are a prehistoric real-world shark, and so AD&D used this as sort of a play on that. Their giant sharks were the largest great whites and the Megalodons, which could grow up to 50 feet in length. And their prehistoric killing machines, they just uh, swim through the oceans and they will attack as many creatures anytime that they can. In second edition D&D, we also had giant sharks and we got a little bit of the ecology and the combat. And this is sort of where the phase that when they had natural animals, the people at D&D seemed to kind of actually go out of their way to research and bring in a uh, real world uh, information about animals and so we talk it talks about how they hunt by uh, sensing pressure changes underwater caused by the noises from other creatures and they're attracted to uh, a bunch of splashing and flopping around because that's what injured fish do and how when you know they can be attracted by blood in the water up to a mile away and when they uh, do gather around a bleeding victim, the sharks all go into a feeding frenzy. And the sharks are able to move forward, take a bite, and then move away so that a medium-sized creature can be attacked by up to 10 sharks in a single round of combat. So that is kind of what they talked about there in 2nd edition. In 3rd edition, we had the huge shark. And the huge shark is, uh, again, a great white shark. And it uh, just goes and attacks people uh, like you would expect. These monsters have a strength of 21. Um, 
dexterity of 15. So they're very strong, they're very dexterous, but they all of these monsters have an intelligence of one. So they're strictly animal intelligence and they strictly are operating by a code of, um, you know, being attracted to prey and biting, not out of maliciousness, not out of uh, any sort of sense of predetermination. It's just sort of a stimulus response type of thing. Fourth edition D&D, we learned about a flesh eater shark. And a flesh eater shark has, a, you know, the feeding frenzy. It has a charge attack called the lockjaw charge. When it bites, it can grapple a an opponent with its teeth and then it has shredding teeth so once it uh, grapples an opponent it can then just sort of shake its head and it deals automatic damage to the opponent uh, because you know that's how sharks in the real world feed and coming into fifth edition we have the giant shark and we're going to talk about the giant shark when we look at the mechanics. So it's normally a CR5 monster. Uh, pretty, pretty scary for land-dwelling creatures that find themselves in an alien environment in water. Um, 23 strength and a 21 constitution. But again, a one intelligence. So they're not, they're not bright. They're just kind of dumb. Then we have the corrupted giant shark that comes to us out of the Nether Deep campaign. And this is on another level entirely, because this is a CR9 monster. And unlike the other sharks that have been in the history of D&D, this one is not a beast. This is an aberration. And that's because of the corruption of the Ruidium. And so it gets a few other very interesting abilities over and above what a shark does. Uh, again, very strong strength of 23, constitution of 21, but still that intelligence of one. So even though it's corrupted and it has some other special powers, it's not particularly bright. You'll find it in the same chapter as the Elixir Avalith that we looked at last week. But in this case, characters are walking through an air-filled chamber in the drowned city when they see a giant shark circling outside. This is a, when they call it drowned city, it's because it's underwater. And there are certain areas of this city that are filled with air because of magic as they're walking through this chamber and as they notice this shark the uh, characters also notice a piece of magical technology which appears to be sputtering and flickering and uh, surprise 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 that means that it's about to fail and when that piece of technology does fail, the area becomes flooded and the corrupted giant shark attacks the characters. So the corrupted giant shark is a much tougher encounter than a normal giant shark. It has three features that normal giant sharks do not have due to the corruption that it has suffered. So the first feature is being within 15 feet of the shark causes psychic damage unless a character succeeds on a DC 17 wisdom saving throw. The second feature is that the Corrupted Giant Shark regenerates 10 hit points per round unless it is dealt a critical hit or unless it suffers radiant damage during the round. And the third difference is that in addition to causing 3d10 plus 6 piercing damage, the bite of the Corrupted Giant Shark confers a level of exhaustion unless the character succeeds on a DC-17 charisma saving throw. So there's two saving throws that you have to make, one when you're near the shark, another one when you're bitten by the shark, and those saving throws will either, if you fail them, you either suffer extra damage or you suffer a level of exhaustion. And for a land-dwelling creature that's trying to swim... A level of exhaustion, oh, that is very, very bad because that starts affecting your 
skill checks in your saving throws. And that's a bad thing to happen when you are trying to breathe air and you're stuck underwater. Let's take a look at the way Matt Mercer and his team describe this corrupted giant shark. Uh, first of all, the giant sharks in general, they're a terror to sea life swimmers and mar mariners alike. The largest of giant sharks can be the size of a whale, and they can capsize vessels with their bulk or bite through the hull of small ships with their powerful jaws and razor-sharp teeth. In addition to its vicious bite, the corrupted giant shark projects a psychic aura that causes painful mental distress in any creatures nearby, and the crystals that corrupt the shark's body also enable it to regenerate, and only radiant energy or particularly devastating attacks can overcome this unnatural defense. Okay, now how the shark came to be corrupted with iridium is unknown. However, the trailing growths of reddish mineral have made this monster even more terrifying, with the projection of its aura of psychic damage and the ability to enervate even the most powerful foes with every bite. Within the Nether Deep campaign itself, the corrupted giant shark circles the failing section of the underwater ruins menacingly, almost as if it has a sense that the tasty morsels inside are about to come within its grasp. Now, the shark is an unintelligent predator, so it will simply attack the closest enemy or the one that thrashes around the most if you want to emulate the behavior of natural sharks. But once the PCs engage in combat with the shark, it's probably fair to say that whoever deals it damage most recently within the round is the creature that a shark is going to try to attack. Once this thing starts attacking, it's just going to kind of go into a shark feeding frenzy. And that means it's just going to keep feeding until there is nothing alive, nothing left to eat, or it's dead. Uh, sharks are not bright animals, <laughs> and they will bite each other, and they don't swim away when they get bitten. It's like, oh, hey, there's more blood, and <laughs> they just kind of go back and make biting. Uh, so that's what your shark is going to do, both in the Nether Deep campaign, and if you use it in your own game, you want to kind of have that be, this is just a machine that either it's going to die, or the PCs are going to die. Mm, that's kind of the way it's going to be. We said before that the Corrupted Giant Shark is an aberration. So it's very interesting that they make it an aberration, and I suppose you have to throw that up to the effect of the corrupting iridium that is in this thing. So aberrations are utterly alien beings. Many have innate magical abilities drawn from the creature's alien mind rather than the mystical forces of the world. Quintessential aberrations are abolesque beholders, mind flayers, and slotty, and apparently corrupted giant sharks. I mentioned something earlier, and I want to go back and talk about it a little bit, because when we look at our variants, we are going to mine this history of D&D &D for our own purposes. And this footnote in the history of the game is were sharks. Now, were sharks are among the most bizarre of the lycanthropes that the D&D &D designers dreamed up. And in the earliest editions of the game, these were imagined as merfolk who had suffered the curse of lycanthropy and were transformed into terrorizing sharks under the light of the full moon. Now, in later editions of the game, it became possible for land-dwelling humans that were bitten by a were shark to contract lycanthropy and suffer this transformation. Now, I personally have never seen a DM do this in a game that I was playing. And I have never done this to my players, mainly because I usually don't run nautical campaigns. Now, I can't imagine this would be a terribly interesting form of lycanthropy in most campaigns. Let's just set the picture. Bob the Barbarian was never quite right. After that time, we dove to the ship shipwreck. He got bit by that one shark, but he seemed okay after Connie the Cleric healed him and we never thought anything of it. Then on the night of the next full moon, we were all awakened in camp as Bob's bedroll began flopping around, 
and after a moment, we saw a shark was there and Bob was gone. At least we thought he was gone until the shark died from lack of water and it turned back into Bob's corpse. <laughs> you see, that's just kind of, that's kind of anticlimactic, right? Because if you're out adventuring in the wilderness, you're a wear shark and you turn into a shark, you really aren't going to hurt anybody unless they're dumb enough to put their hand in front of your teeth. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like I don't quite understand what the designers of D&D &D were thinking about when they came up with the idea of the wear shark. So, unless your campaign is constantly going to be in or near a source of water, I don't see much reason you'd want to use this form of lycanthropy, but we are going to mine it for one of tonight's Corrupted Giant Shark variants. And I think you're going to like what we do because we're making a play on the corruption and another feature of the shark. Our Tier 1 variant is going to be the plain vanilla giant shark from fifth edition. Now a giant shark is a CR5 and that is an appropriate challenge for a level three party. The giant shark is a huge beast, unaligned, armor class 13, 126 hit points, swim speed of 50 feet. It's got a strength of 23, constitution of 21, dexterity 11, intelligence 1, wisdom 10, charisma 5. And it's got blindsight out to 60 feet, passive perception 13. And it has a feature of blood frenzy. So it has advantage on melee attacks, rolls against any creature that doesn't have all its hit points. And it's water breathing. It can only breathe underwater. So its bite is a plus nine, and it deals 3d6 plus 10 piercing damage with each bite. So very powerful, and um, the bites hurt a lot. Now for tier two, we're going to look at Matt Mercer's own Corrupted Giant Shark. Now this is a level or this is a CR9 monster, which is appropriate for a level 5 party. Now, instead of being a beast, we notice that this is an aberration, and it's huge. So, armor class 13, 126 hit points, still a swim speed of 50, point, or 50 feet, um, strength 23, dex 11, con 21, intelligence 1, wisdom 10, charisma 5. So, stat block is pretty much the same. Perception plus four, blind sight to 60 feet, and a passive perception of 14. So, uh, proficiency bonus of plus four. Now, some of its features differ. So, one of its features is a psychic maelstrom. Any creature that starts its turn within 15 feet of the shark must succeed on that wisdom save or take 2d10 psychic damage. Regeneration regains 10 hit points at the start of its turn, but if it takes radiant damage or suffers a critical hit, this trait doesn't function at the start of its next turn. And the shark dies only if it starts its turn with zero hit points and doesn't regenerate. So now that's important. If it's at zero on the start of its turn, but it is able to regenerate, it'll go ahead and regenerate. So you have to have hit it with a critical or hit it with radiant damage in order to actually kill it. That's part of the corruption. That's what makes it so much tougher. It's kind of like a zombie in that respect. So water breathing can only breathe underwater. And the bite is similar. Uh, plus 10 to attack. 3d10 plus 6 damage, and if the target is a creature, it must succeed on a DC 17 charisma save or gain one level of exhaustion. But now we're going to look at some variants, and we're going to go on into tier 3, and we are going to imag imagine a giant sharkithid, which is a shark-elithid hybrid. Hmm... 
what's a shark illithid hybrid going to be like? So this is a tier three monster that is appropriate to throw at parties of 11th level. This is completely homebrew as far as I know. I have never seen this anywhere. So armor class is 16, 136 hit points. It has a swim speed of 80 feet, CR 16, proficiency bonus plus five. So ability score is strength 19, deck 17, con 12, intelligence 17, wisdom 15, charisma 12. Attack bonus of plus 9, damage bonus of plus 4. It gets two bite attacks, which are 4d10 plus 4 piercing damage each. It resists cold and force damage. It's immune to psychic damage. Now it has several other capabilities and these include a tentacle attack it's got four tentacles and each one can attack plus nine to hit 1d10 plus four bludgeoning damage and the opponent is grappled dc 15 escape check to break the grapple if the shark that grapples the same opponent with two or more tentacles it incapacitates the target then it can do its kind of illithid attack thing, which is extract brain. So it targets one incapacitated opponent the Sharkathid has grappled, plus 9 to hit 10d10 piercing damage if the target is reduced to 0. The Sharkathid has killed it by extracting and devouring the creature's brain. And then another sort of illithid um, feature is its mind blast which recharges on a five to six magically emits a psychic energy or magically emits psychic energy in a 60 foot cone each creature in that area must succeed in dc 15 intelligence save or take 22 48 plus four psychic damage and be stunned for one minute creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns ending the effect on itself on a success so that is kind of a play on the idea that, um, you know, if you look at some of the crazier illithid things, they can kind of, mind flayers can kind of be born out of just about any creature. Normally they're intelligent creatures, but, you know, what if a giant shark kind of fed on part of an elder brain and somehow got corrupted by that? Maybe it might turn into a shark at the who knows? You can explain it in your game if you want to use that. And then our tier four monster is a giant were shark. And when I say giant, I literally mean a storm giant were shark. <laughs> Okay, we just got done playing Storm King's Thunder in the Wednesday night game. We got through that story arc. And I, you know, I was reminded that storm giants live under the ocean. And so what about a storm giant with lycanthropy that becomes a storm giant were shark? That would be a pretty impressive monster. So I'm imagining this as an armor class 22, 330 hit points, 50 foot movement in giant form, 80 foot movement in shark form, CR 19, proficiency bonus plus six, ability scores, strength 29, dex 14, con 20, intelligence 16, wisdom 18, and charisma 18. So its attack bonus is plus 18, its damage bonus is plus 9. So Storm Giant form, um, it uses its Great Sword, which is uh, gets 3 attacks with the Great Sword, plus 15 to attack, 66 plus 9 slashing damage each. Shark form, it gets 3 bites. Again, plus 16 to attack, and 60, 10, plus 9 piercing damage for each bite. It resists cold damage. It's immune to lightning and thunder damage. So then it has a few other special abilities. Now, in Storm Giant form, it gains the spell casting of a Storm Giant and the Lightning Strike, which is a recharge of 4 to 6, and the Hurl Rock capability. In Shark form, it 
gains an ability I am calling a Thunder Growl. Recharges on 4 to 6, and it deals 12 D6 Thunder damage and a 17 DC 17 Constitution save or be stunned for one minute. And once again, you can repeat that saving throw at the end of each of your turns to try to break the stun. And then finally, there is Lycanthropy. A creature bitten but not killed by a giant were shark must make a DC 17 constitution saving throw or be cursed with lycanthropy and turn into a shark of its same creature size, so small, medium, etc., etc., on the next full moon. This transformation happens regardless of whether the creature is in water or not. As the full moon approaches, the character will feel compelled to go towards the ocean or a large river or lake. If, lycan if the lycanthropy is undetected otherwise, a successful DC-17 nature check will determine that some curse is drawing the character toward water. That would be a way that you could flavor that if you decided to put that in your campaign. And <laughs> if you decided you wanted to unleash a storm giant were shark on your game world. But that's entirely up to you, Mr. Ms. DM. All right. I have been DM Galabond. This has been Monster Monday. And tonight we've been looking at the Corrupted Giant Shark. So normally I have several other shows that we do, live streams every week with actual play D&D games. The summer schedule has been all over the place because of vacations. First time in two years people have been able to travel. And, um, you know, a busy sports calendar for my soccer team this year because they've actually been doing fairly well and they're involved in in the semifinals of the u.s open cup so they have yet another game this coming wednesday night so we may be playing walker of Waterdeep on sunday we are not going to be playing the wednesday night game and i can't remember if there's another saturday night game next saturday or not so um we might be playing DD on saturday night but normally sunday afternoon at 2 p.m wednesday evening at 8 p.m and saturday evening at 7 30 p.m those are all eastern time us those all happen over on the twitch channel at twitch.tv slash with the archives always here on the youtube channel now this coming friday i am planning to do a very special live stream over on Twitch. And that live stream is my first impressions of the Radiant Citadel. Now, I got busy with work and I messed up on my internal remembering of what the release calendar was. And Radiant Citadel actually came out last week. So I should have done the live stream first impressions on Friday night. But I didn't because I didn't even look at the stupid thing in my uh, list of D&D Beyond sources until Friday when I was starting to put together this show. So I will have to look through the book and I will have to gather my thoughts and give you some first impressions of it on Friday night on the live stream. And then on that live stream, I will also pick a creature and we will do our next Monster Monday on the creature from the Journey to the Radiant Citadel. All right. That's going to do it for our look at the Corrupted Giant Shark. If you've been watching this far, Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. I really wish you would subscribe to the channel, like the video, share the video, and click the post notification bell so that you can get notified every time new content drops on the channel. I have been DM Galabond. This has been Monster Monday. I want to remind you to watch out for the monsters under the bed. Good night, everybody.